Hi, I'm Tanner Johnsrud, and today we'll be talking about giving up the CS view of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a big topic, and because it deals with issues of wrongdoing, it's bound up with our ideas of sin and morality. Maybe you have trouble with these words, but they are inseparable from ideas of forgiveness, and so it's important for us to address them head on. Mary Baker Eddy always presented her teachings as a higher form of morality, the highest, in fact. At first, she called her religion moral science. She claimed to have discovered Christian science in the mid-1860s, but it wasn't until 1875 that she changed the name of her teaching from moral science to Christian science. She writes hundreds of times about the importance of morality. But far from being the highest system of morality on earth, Christian science is another form of an old idea called moralism. Understanding moralism will go a long way to helping us understand the CS teaching on forgiveness and why this CS teaching is so damaging. We'll look at moralism generally, then Christian science specifically, and then we'll see the solution in a better perspective on forgiveness. But we'll start by looking at the age-old idea of moralism. Moralism is a kind of teaching that says that our goal is to be a good person, and that religion is about moral improvement. This teaching insists that our biggest problem is our wrong behaviors, or maybe wrong behaviors and thoughts. And the solution is for us to change our thinking and acting, and just be better people. Now, there are all sorts of different moralists. There are conservative moralists who might emphasize individual traditional behavior and liberal moralists who might emphasize social behavior. There are religious moralists and irreligious moralists, but they all share some common themes. Moralism relies on our thoughts and actions. Moralism in a Christian or quasi-Christian context, reduces the Bible to a manual for behavior. The moralist thinks that if they pray, if they go to church, if they follow basic rules of society, then they're a good person and right with God. Think of how many people in CS focus on reading the lesson, doing their daily protective work, going to church, reading the periodicals, and so on, in order to be a good Christian scientist. Many Christian scientists I knew took pride in never drinking alcohol or coffee, in not stealing or swearing, in not going to doctors or taking medicine, in being good, upstanding citizens. Moralists often feel free to consciously or unconsciously concoct their own sets of rules, or pick and choose rules to follow, typically rules that they feel that they can or want to keep. So they feel good about themselves because they're following their own consciously or unconsciously chosen rules. So moralism tends to lead to a lot of pride. On the other hand, by twisting and reducing Christianity to a set of rules, moralism establishes a crushing weight of burden. If you have to always be thinking rightly or acting rightly to be right with God or to have health and freedom, then you are a, under this constant pressure and face constant condemnation, whether that's the condemnation of others or self-condemnation. For many moralists, they're left with great condemnation and fear that they will never be good enough. So pride and fear are the outcome of moralism. And moralism has devastating consequences on the subject of forgiveness. For those who tend towards pride, moralists will see themselves as basically good people. They aren't fundamentally in need of forgiveness. Maybe every once in a while they'll recognize their failure to follow their own moral code, but if they just lift themselves up by their bootstraps and straighten themselves out and don't do that thing again, then they're all right. Forgiveness isn't that big of a deal. They aren't really in need of forgiveness, and so they don't really recognize the ways they hurt others. 
and don't seek forgiveness from those whom they've hurt. For those who tend towards fear and condemnation, they see themselves always failing to live up to the standards of good thought and behavior. They're subject to continual cycles of condemnation, guilt, and shame. They feel like they're never good enough. They struggle to find forgiveness, whether from those who've imposed the standard upon them or to find forgiveness within themselves. And many moralists go back and forth between different cycles of pride and fear. Moralism wreaks havoc on the idea of forgiveness. And Christian science is just another form of moralism. And it has devastating consequences when thinking about forgiveness. As Christian scientists, we were probably all familiar with a sixth tenet, and maybe the first tenet, but many Christian scientists probably don't know the third tenet off the top of their heads. But the ideas behind the third tenet are deeply ingrained within Christian science and have deeply shaped the lives of every Christian scientist and have impacted most ex-Christian scientists, whether we recognize it or not. And whether we recognize it or not, the CS teaching encapsulated in the third tenet is some of the most damaging teaching in CS. The third tenet centers on the idea of forgiveness. We acknowledge God's forgiveness of sin in the destruction of sin and the spiritual understanding that casts out evil as unreal. But the belief in sin is punished so long as the belief lasts. Now, at first glance, this might seem pretty good. It talks about God's forgiveness of sin, but its effects are extremely damaging. One of the central teachings of C.S., is that sin and evil are unreal. It comes up again and again throughout CS teaching. From the Christian science perspective, the basis for forgiveness is recognizing that the thing to be forgiven is unreal. The sin is really no part of you because you are the perfect image and likeness of God. Christian science teaches that man is perfect And this teaching leads to a radically different view of forgiveness in CS than we find in biblical Christianity. Now, our CS friends and family will say that this teaching is biblical, but that's based on a misunderstanding of the word translated as perfect. They might point to the verse in the Sermon on the Mount where the King James reads, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. But... This is a misreading of the Greek word translated as perfect. The Greek word teleos means whole, complete, or mature. What Jesus is calling us to here is not sinless perfection, but Christian maturity, being complete, maturing into the people God wants us to be. This misreading of the idea of being perfect has significant implications when it comes to thinking about forgiveness. Christian science teaches that we already are perfect. This is an idea that Mary Baker Eddy held about herself. She once said that in 40 years, she had not made a single mistake in being guided in matters pertaining to her cause. She believed that she never made any mistakes, not a single one. And if you never do anything wrong, then you are not in need of forgiveness. Perhaps you've had the experience with some Christian scientists you've known who never admitted their sins, never acknowledged their mistakes, or rarely acknowledged them, or rarely acknowledged the ways that they've hurt other people. Perhaps you had the experience of wanting them to acknowledge these things, and they never did or never could. Perhaps you've had the experience of telling them that you forgive them, 
only for them to say that there is nothing that they did that needed forgiving. Certainly not all Christian scientists are like this, but if you've experienced this, you know the painful effects of this teaching. Like all other forms of moralism, Christian science talks a lot about doing and thinking the right thing, but in actuality, it downplays the significance of sin. In my experience, Christian scientists were fond of describing sin as missing the mark. The way this was frequently used in Christian science circles was to suggest that sin is just missing the truth, and if you aimed better next time, if you stop sinning, then you've destroyed the sin. This is an extraordinarily low view of the nature of sin. Now, she talks about the destruction of sin throughout her writings, but the destruction of sin is merely associated with stopping sinning, with just aiming better next time. She says, science removes the penalty only by first removing the sin, which incurs the penalty. This is my sense of divine pardon, which I understand to mean God's method of destroying sin. If the saying is true, while there's life, there's hope, its opposite is also true. Where there's sin, there's doom. Another's suffering cannot lessen our own liability. That last sentence is a knock on Christian views of Jesus' sacrifice. She also says, the destruction of sin is the, is the divine method of pardon. Divine life destroys death, truth destroys error, and love destroys hate. Being destroyed, sin needs no other form of forgiveness. Does not God's pardon, destroying any one sin, prophesy and involve the final destruction of all sin? According to Mrs. Eddy, the belief in sin is punished so long as the belief lasts. If you stop believing in the sin, if you stop sinning, then the sin is destroyed and you're all set. From the CS perspective, if you remove the sin, if you stop sinning, then sin is destroyed and there is no more penalty for sin. Again, this is an extraordinarily low view of the nature of sin. It essentially says, my mistakes weren't that big of a deal. And once I stop doing them and see that they're no part of me, then everything's fine. But everything is not fine. Sin has an impact far beyond just us. Every sin has an impact upon those around us and the broader world beyond us. When I was a Christian science practitioner, I saw the impact of financial fraud, sexual impropriety, abuse, and so much more. I saw firsthand that just because a father stopped abusing his children didn't mean that there weren't effects that didn't continue for decades. And the solution was not to tell the woman that the abuse she received as a little girl wasn't real. I knew a Christian scientist who had defrauded others of millions of dollars. Just because she wasn't defrauding people anymore didn't mean that everything was okay. People's lives were ruined. They would never get that money back. And they missed mortgage payments or lost their retirement savings. And just saying that the person had stopped sinning didn't fix anything doesn't pay the penalties that the sin caused, and it doesn't set everything right. There are real-life consequences for sin. Sin inflicts deep hurt upon other people, and those consequences can be lasting long after someone stops their negative actions. As I said before, Mrs. Zetti said that in over 40 years of leading the CS movement, she never made a single mistake. She never did anything wrong. She never needed forgiveness. Now, taking this moralistic impulse to downplay sin in herself to the extreme, she went to great lengths to deny any wrongdoing on her part. Rather than acknowledging her long-held support of pro-slavery politicians and acknowledging that she had been wrong, in later years she told fanciful and completely untrue stories of her courageous opposition to slavery while living in the South. There are many examples I could cite to show that she went to great lengths to cover up any wrongdoing on her part. 
When people she appointed to office were found to be engaged in sexual immorality or stealing from church funds, she bore no responsibility. It was always the fault of malicious animal magnetism. Animal magnetism became a convenient way to shift the blame to someone or something else. While most Christian scientists don't go to the lengths that Mrs. Eddy did to downplay her own mistakes, failings, and sins, many Christian scientists do have a tendency to downplay, hide, or shift the responsibility for their failings. Even when Mrs. Eddy speaks in strong terms about denouncing sin, which she does, regarding other people's faults, it is all in the context of encouraging other people to simply change their thinking, change their beliefs, change their ways to be in line with hers. Like all forms of moralism, Christian science fails to recognize the deep-seated problem of sin in our lives and our profound need of forgiveness. As I said, the biblical concept goes far beyond and far deeper than a mistake that we correct. It is true that missing the mark is an implication of one of the biblical words for sin. When the Bible indicates that in sinning we miss the mark, it is saying that we are aiming for something else instead. We have put something else instead of God at the center of our desires. We're loving something else more than we love God. But the Bible doesn't just define sin as missing the mark. The Bible describes it as transgression of the law of God, as going beyond God's will, as rebellion against God. The Bible uses dozens of words and concepts to define sin. The Bible speaks of sin as wickedness and brokenness and perversity, crookedness, depravity, debt, liability, desolation, oppression, lawlessness, injustice, evil, defilement, as pollution. And the list goes on and on. We'll just look at one term. No one would look at this pollution and say it isn't a big deal. Or that... As long as you stop polluting, the effects of it will just go away. We all implicitly understand that pollution is a big problem that has long-lasting effects beyond just changing our ways. So when the Bible refers to sin as pollution, this helps us understand our sin in a more complete way. Christian science downplays the vast range of the Bible's treatment of sin, and most Christian scientists see it largely as a mistake to correct in their thinking. This allows many Christian scientists the freedom to follow in Mary Baker Eddy's footsteps and downplay the idea that they have anything that requires forgiveness. The idea that sin has to be completely destroyed to be forgiven has other consequences as well. Perhaps you've struggled with forgiving those who've hurt you, and you're holding on to the idea that the other person has to completely change their ways before you can forgive them. Maybe you have deep wounds from things that people have done, but our refusal to forgive often adds bitterness to these wounds. Now, this is not to just pass over the pain that other people have caused, but to recognize that Forgiveness is an important part of being able to heal, being able to move on, uh, being able to reconcile and, uh, and find peace. Even if we don't reconcile with others, to be able to find peace within ourselves about the situation. But there's another side to this question. And maybe this is the side that you've had more experience with. As Christian scientists, we were falsely taught that we are perfect and that we have to be perfect, that we should cast out every wrong thought that we have. And he began to realize how daunting a task that is. The basis of forgiveness in CS is destroying every wrong thought that you have ever had, every thought you've had that wasn't in line with what we called divine principle. 
And so perhaps you found or still find yourself in cycles of trying very hard to overcome some pattern of sin in your life without success. And so you end up in cycles of self-condemnation. Perhaps you were like many Christian scientists and alternated between never-ending cycles of pride and self-condemnation. Furthermore, if you were a Christian scientist, you believe that sickness in your life was the result of error in thought, error that you were accepting, believing, or not fighting hard enough against. So as you struggled with sickness or physical suffering, you believed that on one level it was your fault. Mary Baker Eddy says to cure a bodily ailment, every broken moral law should be taken into account and the error be rebuked. Every broken moral law? That means every sin, every lie, every judgmental thought, every hint of pride. And you can't be healed without destroying every single form of the sin? She says, Christ or truth will destroy all other supposed suffering and real suffering for your own sins will cease in proportion as the sin ceases. Oh, Christian science strongly links the ideas of sin and suffering. And your suffering ends to the degree that your sin ends. If you're poor... That's your own fault. She says, if the primary students are still impecunious, it is their own fault. And this ill success of itself leaves them unprepared to enter higher classes. And if you had children, you knew that their problems had to be handled in your thought, which meant that if they were sick or injured, it was your fault. She says, if the case is that of a young child or an infant, it needs to be met mainly through the parent's thought, silently or audibly, on the aforesaid basis of Christian science. No, I could go on and on. Christian science, like all forms of moralism, leads to cycles of condemnation and fear. As... Christian scientists, we were condemned for every single problem that we had. And in CS, unless you fully and finally overcame every last bit of every wrong thought that you ever had, the sin wasn't really destroyed and you couldn't really be forgiven. Every sickness, every weakness, every challenge was a source of condemnation. Perhaps you left CS years ago, but you still feel guilt and shame every time you have a physical problem. You wonder what you might have done to bring it on yourself. You might be quick to condemn yourself and perhaps assume that if something has gone wrong, that it is your fault and it reflects some moral failing on your part. These are all lingering effects of CS moralism. Now, perhaps all you have known is CS or some form of moralism. Perhaps because of your background in CS, you assume that all religion is basically different forms of moralism. Perhaps you left CS years ago, but you're bringing a moralistic impulse to your Christian walk today. But I'd like to point us to a different way by taking a quick overview from the book of Romans. The Bible teaches us that we have a much deeper and more prevalent problem with sin than moralism teaches us. It shows us that sin isn't just bad or socially unacceptable behavior. It is more than just wrong thoughts. It is a disposition of the heart. It is a disposition of the heart towards pride, towards wanting to follow our ways, not God's. 
this is the natural inclination of all of our hearts. No one has ever had to teach their young children to lie or to be selfish or to get angry if they don't get what they want. We all have these inclinations by nature. Thinking that we can just try to stop sinning is a vain idea because it fundamentally ignores the depth of the problem. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In Romans, we also see, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. We all have hearts that are inclined towards ourselves more than towards God. We have all said and done things which are out of accord with God's demands upon our lives. We've all contributed to polluting and defiling God's creation. There's none of us who are intrinsically righteous and good. We have all violated God's pure holiness and rebelled against his perfect nature. We have all sought to dethrone God and put ourselves or our desires at the center of our lives. There is no place for thinking that we don't sin, that we don't violate God's law. And so there's no place for thinking that we can be right with God through our own merit. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. There's no place for boasting, no place for pride, when we take an honest look at what sin really is. Like the rest of the Bible, the book of Romans teaches us that there are real consequences for sin. For the wages of sin is death. The death that Paul speaks of here isn't just physical death, but also of being cut off from God, of spiritual and eternal death. But that is not the end of the story. The verse continues, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The way out of the moralistic cycles of pride and condemnation is through recognizing that our freedom, our salvation, is a freely given gift of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Recognizing it as a freely given gift, as an unmerited gift, silences our pride because we see that there is nothing that we could have done to have earned it. But we are saved entirely because of God's freely given gift. It silences our fear and self-condemnation because we see that we didn't have to earn it and we couldn't have. Instead, we can just rest in receiving the unmerited gift of salvation that God has given us through Jesus. How, how does this gift come to us? Romans says, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died in our place while we were yet sinners. The Bible tells us that as the one who alone is fully God and fully man, he alone was perfect. He alone was without sin. He alone was never in need of forgiveness. And yet he died so that we would be forgiven. On the cross, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, 
This forgiveness is fully unmerited. There is nothing that we can do to earn this forgiveness. We don't deserve it. It is completely unmerited. Jesus died for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. He paid the full penalty that we could never pay. None of us could ever live a perfectly sinless life in this world. None of us could ever fully pay the debt that we owe on account of our sin. Just stopping the sin doesn't begin to address the long-lasting effects of the sin, and it doesn't pay the penalty for the consequences of the sin. Only Jesus, as someone who is fully God and thus an infinite being, could pay the infinite debt that we owe for each and every sin we have committed. But he, being also fully man, bore the consequences that we should have borne. He died in our place. And his resurrection is the proof that God accepts his death in payment for our sins. Paul tells us that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses, our sins, and raised for our justification. He rose again in proof that he fully paid the penalty due for our sin. And because he rose again, we are justified, which is the biblical way of saying that we have a right relationship with God. And we can fully and freely receive salvation, not through our effort or trying to clean up our act. Instead, we freely receive it as a gift through faith. Paul in Romans shows us how to escape the cycles of pride and condemnation. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confessing that Jesus is Lord and believing from the heart that he died and rose for you, you will be saved. Now, this isn't just for the good people, people who stopped sinning, who think that they have their act all together. This is for all of us. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God doesn't tell us to clean up our act before we can be saved. We have a right relationship with him through faith, and that sets us free to live in a new way. Our identity is not bound up in our good performance or in our failure, but our identity is found in Christ Jesus. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Think of that. No more condemnation. No condemnation for not standing porter at the door enough. No condemnation for not being good enough. No condemnation for our sickness and our weakness. No condemnation for the ways that we encouraged other people in CS and perhaps unintentionally brought harm to our loved ones. No condemnation even for the ways we intentionally rebelled against God and hurt others. This brings incredible peace. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think of that. Complete peace with God. And if we have complete peace with God, who alone is pure and perfect, that is the basis for having peace with one another and with ourselves.
We no longer have to feel as if we are under God's condemnation. We no longer have to try to justify ourselves by trying harder, cleaning ourselves up more, or thinking better thoughts. We aren't trying and failing to reconcile ourselves to an impersonal divine principle. Rather, our loving triune God has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus. We have peace with God. When we realize that we are forgiven not on the basis of our goodness, that enables us to have peace with one another. When we recognize that we have been fully forgiven already through Christ, that gives us the freedom to acknowledge our sins to others. We can freely confess to others the ways that we have failed them or hurt them. We aren't trying to protect our pride or seem as if we are perfect anymore. When we see how freely we have been forgiven in Christ, we can freely seek forgiveness from others. Similarly, when we see that we have been fully forgiven by Jesus, even when we don't deserve forgiveness, that opens the door for us to forgive those who have hurt us, whether or not we feel they deserve forgiveness, whether or not they've stopped hurting us or acknowledged that they have. In CS, the sin has to be destroyed before the CS God can forgive. But with the freedom that we have in Jesus, we can open the door to forgiving others who have hurt us while still acknowledging the damage that they've done or may continue to do. Being able to forgive others isn't necessarily easy, but the power of the gospel, recognizing that we are fully and freely forgiven in Christ and this forgiveness is unmerited, this opens up the way for us to forgive others and our forgiveness for others can be gracious and unmerited. We aren't waiting for others to get their act together before we can forgive them. Instead, we can extend the same unmerited forgiveness we have fully and freely received because of Jesus. And when we see that we have been fully and freely forgiven by God, then that releases us from the crushing burden that we may have been bearing. We can recognize that if God forgives us, that we can fully forgive ourselves. We will not have sinless perfection in this life, but if we recognize that Jesus died and rose again for us, we are set free to live in a new way. We seek to turn away from sin in our life, not out of pride or self-condemnation, but out of love and gratitude. Christianity isn't about a set of rules that we follow. It's about being set free by Jesus. And the Bible is clear throughout that because of what Jesus did in dying and rising for us, we will be set free forever. We will live forever with him in the world to come, forever free from condemnation, forever free from the stain of sin and condemnation. We will never again suffer, and the effects of sin will forever be washed away.